The first topic is methanol collapse, an obstetrician's nightmare. So I do have a conflict of interest. I'm one of the trainers for the intensive course in obstetric emergencies. Prof. Zalia is also one of the trainers. So part of the material that I'm going to present today is also taken from the handbook. So there's only one reason why I took up obstetrics. And I'm sure the reason remains the same. Because as obstetricians, we strongly believe on one mantra. That no woman should die by bringing life into the world. And this is one mantra that I hold on to strongly every single day. So before I start, let's test your knowledge. If you can answer all five questions correctly, you can go for early lunch. <laughs> but if you only answer one, you'll have to stay here for the next half an hour and listen to my talk. Is that okay? <laughs> Number one, does anyone know what is the antidote for lignocaine? The most commonly used medication in the labor ward. Almost 90 over patients need lignocaine. Antidote? Anyone? Good. So you have to listen to my talk. <laughs> Question number two. What is the first sign of magnesium toxicity? Anyone? Good. There's one sign before loss of tendon reflexes. Do you know what's that? Sorry? Reduce in your output, no? Okay, I can't really hear one answer, so I assume we will cover that in the lecture. So question number three, how many methods are there to do manual uterine displacement? So in the past, we used to recommend left lateral, but now left lateral is out of fashion because that makes CPR ineffective. So what is recommended now is a uterine displacement. Do we know how many methods there are? Good. So you have to listen to me. And the final question, in performing resuscitative hysterotomy, do you perform it in a supine position or a left lateral position? Okay, so I do hear some answers. So anyway, I will cover all these questions in the lecture. So first I'm going to talk about the significance of metal collapse. I'm sure every one of you all remember the last pregnant mother who collapsed in your labor ward. We're going to talk about some common causes that all of us must know. But most importantly, I'm going to talk about some sinister causes that we must rule out, that we as obstetricians sometimes forget. I'm going to quickly talk about what is new, some of which has already been covered by Prof. Zaleha. There's going to be a little bit of overlap. I'm going to give you my own eight steps, so please do not quote me. This is something which is simple because I cannot remember complicated things. And finally, some take-home message. So let me define what metal collapse is. Metal collapse is a cardiorespiratory event with or without loss of consciousness. So you don't really have to have an unconscious mother to diagnose collapse. Any cardiorespiratory event is a collapse that happens in any pregnant mother up till six weeks post delivery or post miscarriage or post ectopic pregnancy. So the definition is simple. Let's talk about some facts. So every day, sadly, there's about 830 methanol deaths throughout the world. That means every two minutes, there's one mother that dies. The incidence of metal collapse has been quoted to be between 1 in 12,000 to 1 in 30,000, but I believe the incidence is far higher. I can honestly tell you the incidence of metal collapse in where I work is 1 in 1,000. But among all the patients who collapse, despite obstetricians not being really skilled in CPR, the pregnant mother actually has got the highest survival. So we should be proud of that. That is not because of us, but that's because the patients are much younger. But most of the time, we resuscitate the mother, but the fetus has got a better survival rate than the mother. And these are some interesting facts with regards to mental collapse. So here's a recent paper published in the ACOG journal with regards to the causes of mental collapse. 45% of them is hemorrhage, 13% amniotic fluid embolism, a heart failure, almost 1 in 10, sepsis is on the rise, and anesthetic issues. 
I believe the trend in Malaysia is almost similar like this. But interestingly, this year, there's a study published in the BGOG titled the CAP study, which looked into incidents of metal collapse in the UK. Interestingly, one in four mothers who died were actually due to anesthetic complications. And I believe in the near future, this trend will also be on the rise. I can honestly share a secret. The last three months where I work, we had three mothers who collapsed, and almost three of them were because of anesthetic issues. So please think about it the next time you have a mother who collapsed. So this is the most recent confidential inquiry into methanol death. It is unpublished data. If you look through the leading cause of methanol death, it's actually medical disorders in pregnancy. And hence, I'm really, really, really very pleased that this hall is filled today, that all of you all came here, hopefully, to take back some information in regards to methanol medicine. The second cause, which is on the rise, is actually pulmonary embolism. Unfortunately, the death from PPH has been coming down. So I believe if these trends continue, PPH will no longer be the second cause. PPH will be perhaps the third or the fourth cause. Sadly, we also know that almost 70% of the time, when there's a metal collapse, we can do better. We could have prevented. There's always room for improvement. So what are the challenges in maternal resuscitation? Is it easy to intubate a pregnant mother? Nope. Breast engorgement, laryngeal edema makes intubation far more difficult. So if you are not trained, I would say do not attempt an intubation. All you need to do is to protect the airway and maintain oxygenation. A pregnant mother has got a higher risk of Mendelssohn's syndrome. It's got a higher risk of aspiration. So never let go of the tricot pressure that is extremely, extremely important. And always think about proton pump prophylaxis. Blood loss can be rapid. The uterus actually gets more than 500 mils per minute. All you need is 8 minutes for a mother to collapse. Clinical signs are late signs. So please do not rely on pulse rate. Do not rely on blood pressure. Those are all late signs. An autocaval compression. Any gravid uterus beyond 20 weeks reduces cardiac output by 30%. And hence, you need lateral tilt or uterine displacement. And please remember, because of the splinting of the diaphragms, there's reduction in your expiratory reserves. The pregnant mother can be hypoxic more easily and more severely. So what are the causes of maternal collapse? If you are a fan of pneumonics, if you read the RCOG guidelines, it's 4H, 4E and 4E. So what are the 4Hs? For some unknown reason, my animations are not working today. So that is fine. So H, the first H is hypovolemia. The second H is hypoxia. The third H is hypothermia. We often forget hypothermia. And the fourth H is hyper or hypokalemia. If you like T's, the first T is thromboembolism. The second T is toxicity. The third T is tamponade, cardiac tamponade. And the fourth T is tension pneumothorax. And the E is everyone's favorite, which is eclampsia. But honestly, I don't really like these mnemonics. So how do I approach a patient who's collapsed? <coughs> Common things occur commonly. Most of the time, it is because of postpartum hemorrhage, which is wonderfully covered by Prof. Zalea. So I'm not going to talk about PPH. But if you do not see blood per vaginally, the blood can be intra-abdomen. So think of uterine like rupture. Think of broad ligament hematomas. Think of concealed abruption. In eclampsia, think of two things. When a pregnant mother presents with headache or hypertension, never forget to examine the fundus. Never forget to auscultate the lungs. 
because a common reason for a mother to collapse in the labor ward could be acute pulmonary edema. Think about intracranial hemorrhage. A common reason for a pregnant mother to collapse is embolism. It could be pulmonary embolism or amniotic fluid embolism. If a mother suddenly collapses in labor and she's coagulopathic when the bleeding is not significant or severe, think of amniotic fluid embolism. But it is not always the uterus to be blamed. Based on various confidential inquiries, two other important organs that can bleed is the spleen and is the liver. So any pregnant mother that presents with an acute abdomen, if you go into the OT to do a caesarean section, please also think of two other organs, spleen and the liver, especially if they present with an acute abdomen or a pleuritic chest pain. So we'll move on to other causes. Sepsis is on the rise. The most common organism is group A streptococcus. The most important organism for the baby is GBS. For the mother is GAS. So let's talk about medications. So lignocaine, commonly used in the liver ward. The antidote is intralipid or lipid emulsions. So please think of toxicity if a mother collapses. What is the antidote for magnesium sulfate? Exactly. What is the antidote for opioids? Naloxone. And also think about anesthetic causes. Common anesthetic causes of collapse is a high spinal aspiration or bronchospasm. So two days ago, before coming here, I was on call on Saturday. There was a patient who collapsed in the gynae ward. The medical officer and the registrar had high flow mass, two large ball branulas, gave her fluids, gave her blood, but we forgot to check the dextrostick. The dextrostick was 1.7. So commonly missed cause hypoglycemia, hyperkalemia, hyponatremia. Please do not miss these simple causes. So the first sign of magnesium toxicity is actually not loss of deep tendon reflexes. The normal magnesium level is 2 to 4. To lose your tendon reflexes, you should actually have a magnesium level of 6 to 8. For respiratory depression, the magnesium level is 8 to 12. And for the mother to collapse, you need to have a magnesium level of above 12. But I want to pick it up early. When the magnesium level is above 5, you will have ECG changes. The changes are prolonged PR interval and white QRS complex. So the next time you have a patient who's on magnesium sulfate, please monitor the heart rate. You'll be able to pick it up way much earlier. Sepsis. Any pregnant mother who comes in with fever, of course you have to rule out dengue, but one easy test that should be done is the lactates. Lactate is a simple marker of tissue hypoperfusion. If a lactate is above 2, that is not normal. If a lactate is above 4, the patient should not be in the labor ward, should be in the ICU. So please remember, any pregnant mother that comes in feeling unwell or have a temperature, send a serum lactate. Blood cultures, antibiotics involve consultants. I'm going to give you a simple mnemonic. The number to remember is 4, and the number to remember is 30. If the patient comes in septic shock, the amount of fluid that needs to be given is 30 mils per kilo. But despite giving 30 mils per kilo, if she's still hypotensive, that is an indication for inotropes. Please remember, it is not just fluids, 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 and fluids. Sepsis is different from hypovolemia from PPH. High spinal. So as I said, in the last three months we have had two patients who have got high spinal. All of us are not anesthetists, but we should be able to recognize or be aware of high spinal. Hypotension post spinal is very normal. The recommendation is phenyl ephedrine and not ephedrine because that improves the fetal cardiovascular circulation. But if the mother has got hypotension and bradycardia, please 
think of a possible cause, it could be high spinal. All you need to do is ask her to cough, shake her hands, and see whether she's got difficulty breathing. If she cannot touch her nose, she cannot cough, she cannot grip your hand, think of a high spinal. Management is protection of the airway. So the next time you have a patient who collapses, just immediately after a spinal, think about hypotension, think about bradycardia. Don't just say it is amniotic fluid embolism. It is not always the issue. Cardiac causes. About 40% of women who died in Malaysia actually had a cardiac event. So what are the three cardiac things that you must think of when a mother collapses? Number one is aortic dissection. She will come in with severe pain which is retrosternal in nature between the scapulas. Think about aortic dissection if you've got a very thin, a very tall patient or a patient who has got a connective tissue disease. Basically, I'm talking about patients with Marfan's syndrome. You cannot pick it up in an echo. You can only pick it up if you have an index of suspicion. If the patient is now not thin, if the patient is obese, if the patient is having dyslipidemia and diabetic, think about acute coronary syndrome. Now, ST inversion, T waves and Q waves can be normal in pregnancy. But what is never normal? ST elevation. You will never have ST elevation in a pregnant mother. So the ECG shows ST elevation, you are in trouble. And of course, a common cause is peripartum cardiomyopathy. How do you diagnose peripartum cardiomyopathy? Well, the symptoms of left heart failure, namely crepitations, fetal edema, reduced in effort tolerance. The symptoms are usually chronic. The symptoms are acute. It is APO. So think about three cardiac causes. So as I mentioned earlier, you may have ST depression, but ST elevation is never normal in pregnancy, hence ECG is extremely important. I'm going to quickly move on to neurological causes of maternal collapse. The first presentation with seizure is of course eclampsia until proven otherwise, but do think about epilepsy, do examine the fundus, you may pick up an intracranial hemorrhage. What is more important and most common, any patient that comes in with an acute neurological condition, don't just do a CT brain. The CT brain is only to identify bleeding. The CT brain is normal. You have to think about cerebral vein thrombosis. The diagnosis is an MRI and an MRV. So when is the last patient with cerebral vein thrombosis that I saw? I saw one on Thursday. So it is common, if you think about it, you will pick it up and you can actually treat it. The lady actually presented with one episode of seizure, it was not a claims here, and she had cerebral vein thrombosis. Something that we often miss is anaphylaxis, especially in patients who have got asthma, atopy, or history of allergies. So please ensure anaphylactic shock, despite being rare, can also be one of the causes for collapse. Management is adrenaline, chlorpyrimine, or hydrocortisone. So with that, I'm going to quickly summarize some new things which is being recommended for metal collapse. Some of this has already been covered by Prof. Zaleha. So we do know now that clinical signs are late signs. The fact that a mother is tachycardic means she would have lost 15% of her blood volume. The fact that the mother is hypotensive means she's already lost 30% of her blood volume. So what is recommended now is a shock index. It's an early marker of shock. And please use this in your labor ward, in your HDW. You'll be able to intervene earlier. Anything above 0.9 or anything nearing 0.9 is not normal. For example, the mother's heart rate is 100, 
the mother's blood pressure is 100 over 60. The shock index is 1. She's already in shock, although her heart rate is only 100. So manual uterine displacement. My earlier question was how many methods are there? There are actually four methods of performing manual uterine displacement. Previously, we used to do the left lateral tilt, but if you're going to CPR a mother in the left lateral position, the chest compression becomes ineffective. So two ways is one hand or two hands. So what is recommended is two hands. There's two ways to do two hands. Two hands push, two hands pull. And what is recommended is a two hand pull technique. Any pregnant mother who's beyond 20 weeks who had a maternal collapse, irrespective of the cause. Prof Zaleha wonderfully sold a new product in UKM. I'm really interested. <laughs> I think we should use it. In the use of non pneumatic anti shock garments is extremely vital, especially when you're going to transfer the patient. It is expensive, it does cost about 1,500 ringgit. And I strongly recommend you buy the UK one. Resuscitation in hypovolemia. So I'm sure all of us can appreciate that there's actually a principle with regards to fluid resuscitation. If a pregnant mother loses one liter of blood, giving her one fine normal saline is not going to treat her. And I'm sure everyone's favorite is one fine normal saline. So the ratio to blood loss to crystalloids is 1 to 3. So if she loses 1 litre of blood, you have to give her 3 litres of crystalloids just to catch up. Where else, if she loses 1 litre of blood, then you can give her 1, li one litre of colloids. So the ratio is 1 to 1 for colloids. But for many, many, many years, this was our algorithm of management. When the patient bleeds, when the patient is in shock, when the patient is collapsed, we give her fluids first, plenty, 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 plenty of fluids. We dilute more of the clotting factors, and then only we give her blood. And finally, by the time the blood product comes, the patient is already in the ICU or elsewhere. And I believe this algorithm is not physiological. What is recommended now is a thing called damage control resuscitation. It's widely used in trauma patients. And this is far more physiological. The moment you have a patient who is caused, don't just give fluids and wait and then blood later. Give her everything at the same time. The moment a patient is collapsed, she needs fluids, blood and blood products. Everything has to go in simultaneously. It is not waiting for the FBC and not waiting for the fibrinogen which comes back tomorrow morning. There's one important thing that we often forget. Remember the third hitch in metal collapse? It is hypothermia. So there's this important thing called a lethal triad. If the mother is coagulopathic, if the mother is acidotic, and if the mother is hypothermic, mortality can be as high as 70%. <coughs> the next time you're going to transfuse blood, please don't use that S sandwich that you have in the labor ward. That does not work. What you need is actually a fluid warmer from the tip right till the end. And please think of hypothermia prevention the next time you have a mother who collapses. How to perform CPR effectively? So when I was a house officer, what we remembered was hard and fast. That is what I was taught. But now we now know that you don't want to be too hard you should not go beyond 6 centimeters because you're going to fracture some ribs. You don't want to do too fast as well. The rate should be anything between 100 to 120 beats per minute. What is important is you should allow time for recoil. And that is most important. You should minimize pauses in between chest compressions. And when I was a house officer, I used to do CPR for half an hour and one hour until a medical officer comes and says, okay, it's time to stop. But that is CPR fatigue. 
You can only do the proper cycle for the first two cycles. The third cycle is no more 5 cm, it's only 2 cm. And then becomes 1 cm later. So CPR fatigue is important. Every two cycles change. The person giving the airway do the chest compression. The person doing the chest compression does the uterine displacement. And other person, bags and mass. So rotate in a clockwise manner. Interestingly, here's a study that we published in ICO. We looked into cadres of staff and how good were they in performing CPR. Now, various guidelines recommends call the consultant when there's a metal collapse. But we realized that a consultant who's excellent in hysterectomies is the poorest in doing CPR. So yes, please call the consultant. But what I'm trying to say is any single staff, irrespective of seniority, we should always go for drills, training, there's something to learn for everyone. I'm sure every hospital has got an MTP ratio, and now we do know that in patient who's collapsed, the ratio of plasma to FFP should be 1 to 1 to 1. There's no more recipes, there's no more DIC regimes, there's no more 6 or 2. We don't want to give FFP early, but if the patient bleeds significantly, the first thing that you give is FFP. Think of cryo because cryo has got more fibrinogens. So the ratio now is 1 to 1 to 1. If you're going to give 4 units of PAC cells, give 4 units of FFP in the same sitting. Earlier use of FFP reduces the need for cryo and platelets. Prof. Zaleha wonderfully spoke about ISBA. I think it is a wonderful tool that we should use. Let me give an example of ISBA. I am Muniz, the house officer from the labor ward. I've got a metal collapse. She's a 35-year-old para-5 who delivered 30 minutes ago. She's in hypovolemic shock. I think she needs a hysterectomy. So all that it took me was 10 seconds and you can transfer information effectively. It is wonderful. I think we should use the early warning scoring chart. It is very, very, very important, especially in the high dependency warning unit. It's got three colors, white, yellow, and red. I think we are really good in doing observations, but do we intervene appropriately? So there's any clinical sign which is in the white, you don't have to inform anyone, plan, continue the same. There's any two parameters in the yellow, you have to inform the registrar or the specialist. There's any one parameter in the red, you have to inform the specialist straight away. This is for earlier intervention. So what happens in my HDW, the blood pressure is 170, 80, 170, 80, 170, 80. It has not been informed to anyone until 8 o'clock in the morning when we do something, and that is not appropriate. As substitutions, we should also be familiar with regards to ABG. If a pregnant mother has got a PCO2 of 35, that is normal if she's not pregnant. But a PCO2 of 35 is never normal in pregnancy because there's <coughs> hyperventilation. So the next time you see a pregnant mother, please use pregnancy-specific ranges. The most commonly that I see is the PCO2 and the bicarb. Please remember, the normal value of PCO2 is 27 to 32. Sadly, in the previous confidential inquiry, a significant number of mothers died from pneumonia, namely because the oxygen saturations were not read appropriately. I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about resuscitative hysterotomy. Previously, it was called perimortem caesarean section, but now the new term is resuscitative hysterotomy. You don't do it when the mother is just about to die. You do it as part of a resuscitation. So what is recommended is a resuscitative hysterotomy kit. It should be made available in the labor ward, in the PAC, in the antenatal ward, even in the ED. All you need is the six instruments. If you've got a mother who collapses 
who's beyond 20 weeks pregnant make a decision by the fourth minute, a decision by a senior person, and you do it to save the mother, not for the baby. Team management is extremely important. Every time when there's a metal collapse, this is where I stand and I do nothing. I don't put my hand in my pocket, but I just ensure that the team performs. It's important to ensure that these individuals work as a team. The team dynamics is good. You've got a helicopter view of the situation, but the team leader actually does not do anything else. So the next time you have a collapse, please ensure that the team leader stands by the patient's tail end. He's got a helicopter view of what is happening and ensure that the team performs systematically. What happens? There's often chaos. So the next time there's a complex, there's a metal collapse, please just take a look and do nothing. Perhaps someone can record that. But please don't put it on Facebook. Now one important thing that we often forget as obstetricians is the rhythms. Some metal collapse need to be shocked. I'm not a cardiologist. I'm not good at reading ECGs. But I can tell you two rhythms. I can identify VF, I can identify VT, and these are the rhythms that need to be shocked. So every one of you all who is going back tomorrow morning to work, please ensure that your labor ward has got defibrillator machines. Please ensure you know where it is. The next time there's a patient who collapsed, don't just do a VE, but please also call for the defib machine. If you see VF, if you see VT, you can actually shock and save a life. So to summarize eight steps in resuscitation, if you ask me what is the Glasgow Coma Scale, I cannot remember. I only know AVPU. The patient's awake, the patient responds to verbal simulation, the patient responds to pain, the patient is unresponsive. I think this is simple, we can use it. If you think the patient is unresponsive, Use ISBA, it is not coming, sorry. Um, the second step is use ISBA. The third step is to use uterine displacement. The fourth step, you don't really have to intubate the patient. If you're not trained in intubation, use laryngeal mask, use oropharyngeal airways. To intubate and fail and aspirate is far more dangerous. So please use airway adjuncts. The fifth step is to use defibrillators, check ECG patterns. If the mother still is not responsive, make a decision for resuscitative hysterotomy. And finally, risk management and documentation. So what are the essentials? You need a good team, you need guidelines. Two important things that are never found in the labor ward. The pulse oximeter, you can actually buy this in Lazada. I actually bought this in Lazada. Uh, because I had no money in my hospital. The ECG machines, adrenaline, the dose is the same, and your defibrillators. If you cannot use defibrillators, use automated devices. I did find one in the airport when I just landed yesterday. The medications that you need, adrenaline dose is the same. VF, VT, the dose of amiodarone, let the cardiologist or anesthetist decide, but you can shock. For opioid overdose, naloxone, magnesium toxicity, use calcium gluconate. And please remember, lignocaine toxicity is often missed. The recommendation is infralipid. I would recommend one other medication to be made available, which is lorazepam which is used for patients who have got status epilepticus. So with that, I would like to summarize with this presentation. If you have a hemorrhagic cause, think of four important organs. The uterus, most commonly, the brain, the liver, and the spleen. If a mother presents with chest pain, think of aneurysm, think of acute coronary syndrome. The mother presents with a neurological sign, Think of eclampsia. Don't forget epilepsy. The cerebral vein thrombosis will be missed in a CT scan. 
If you think about toxicity, always think about calcium gluconate, think about intralipids. Never forget hypoglycemia. And a common cause is embolism, which is amniotic fluid embolism. So with that, take home message, fast and effective resuscitation is important. In the labor ward, you need to measure respiratory rate. Now everyone in my hospital has got a respiratory rate of 22. Irrespective of acute exacerbation, somber embolism or spontaneous labor. So please measure respiratory rate. Please use pulse oximeter. Fever, think of lactates. ECGs should be made available in the labor ward. Never forget rhythms. Resuscitative hysterotomy, I think each unit should have their own protocol. Have a systematic approach and we need a multi-professional team. And with that, thank you very much for your attention.